I've been working very hard on my PowerPoint skills recently. Uh, this, is a, this is a kind of a show and tell session. So um, I've, been, I've been sort of hiding away in my cupboard over the last few months working on uh, a new implementation of uh, Idris. And I just want to show, show you where it is. So just out of curiosity, has anyone played with any dependently typed programming languages before, just by way of show of hands? OK, that's, that's great, because I, mean, I, I ask this question often, and it's nice to see bigger proportions of hands going up over time. So that's, that, that's marvelous. I'm not going to ask you how you know, experienced you are or anything. I'm just going to assume that you've seen the basics uh, before. And I'm going to show you how the new version of Idris uh, does some of those basics and some of the new things it can do and why I've done it in the first place. So um, there's a few things I want to do in this talk. Um, point one. What's the answer to point one? Are we OK? If I read it out, it's kind of good. Hands are going up at the back. So if hands didn't go up, it says check whether this font size is big enough. So um, right. So. Um, there's an important question of why did I, why did I, I even start doing this? So, so a couple of years ago, um, doing new things with Idris, I was working on kind of I, one of my interests is in kind of tracking state in types, tracking tracking how the state of the outside world changes and getting the type system to help you get it right. So it's particularly interesting when it comes to say concurrent programming or network protocol programming. So you want to get these things right. And I was thinking, well, how how can I how can I use the type system? to write these programs and be confident that they work. But I was increasingly getting to a point where the type checker was taking too long, and it was getting frustrating. And it's kind of, whose fault is that then? So, um, so I thought, OK, maybe I should step back and think about re-engineering this. And I thought, well, if I'm going to re-engineer it, maybe I should try re-engineering it in itself and see if I can learn a bit about where the type system is going to help me on the way. So I'm not, going to, I'm not today going to say too much about where the type system has helped me in the implementation of Idris 2 itself. That's a talk for another time. Uh, I might allude to it from time to time. Mostly, I want to show you the results of this, um, uh, of this work. So what do we, what do we, well, I'll say a little bit about the progress we've got so far and what's coming up. So firstly, uh, definitely faster type checking. Um, I'm at a point at the minute where I, I've just made it a kind of a big, uh, a big improvement in the speed. And I'm, I'm retype checking things just for the joy of seeing things type check in reasonable time. It's marvelous. Um, I don't get out much, you know. So, so, there's, um, um, so I'm going to show you a bit about the new interactive editing feature. So one of the key things about Idris and type-driven development, and I don't think, uh, I, I, when people start playing with, with, certainly with Idris, I don't think this really comes across enough that it's all about the interactive editing. It's all about the, 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 the machine and the programmer being in a conversation. So it's, it's, it's too easy when, uh, when you're writing a, a program in a language with a more complicated type system, it's, it's quite easy to get into this feeling that the machine is your adversary, your enemy. And you know, people come on the mailing list or the IRC channel and they use phrases like, oh, Idris hates me because, or Idris is shouting at me because. I don't want you to think Idris is shouting at you. Idris is trying to help you. It's trying to be in a conversation with you. And I think we need to, uh, one thing we need to do is work quite a lot harder at making that be the way people interact with the system. So that's something I'm trying to do with this new version as well. We'll maybe see a little bit of, um, uh, of, of that uh, as we go as well. Um, and the, the, the key new feature of the language, though, is that um, it's based on uh, quantitative type theory. So quantitative type theory uh, is um, a new core language that's been developed uh, over the last couple of years by uh, Connor McBride and uh, Bob Afke. Um, and the idea with quantitative type theory is that every variable is annotated with how many of it there are, essentially. That's kind of the intuition behind it. And uh, there are three interesting numbers, 0, 1, and everything else. So um, zero means this is going to be erased at runtime, and the type checker has told me that it's going to be erased at runtime. One means I can use this exactly once at runtime, and many is just back in the old world where we always used to be. Uh, we can have lots of these things at runtime. Um, and then we'll see examples of what, where that goes. Hopefully, I'll have enough time to get to uh, my, my favorite thing that I like to try with, with new, um, these new resource-aware uh, types is, can I implement um, session types 
So sort of inspired by Kohei Honda and many others by now, a system for describing the types of concurrent communicating systems. Turns out if you have uh, linearity and dependent types, you absolutely can do that. Um, and I think, I think it's quite a nice way of, of, of writing concurrent programs. So oh, also, please contribute. Go to GitHub. Um, it's, it's, I, I only made it public about a week ago. Uh, the reason I held off, I know some people have been saying, when are you going to let me have a go with this? Um, I, I've changed it too many times, and I was slightly scared that um, I would completely change my mind about the implementation of some core detail after someone had spent ages working on something related to it. I'm confident that's not going to happen now. So, um, so please come along. I'd love to have your contributions. Right, so um, this is a dependent type talk. So by law, I have to show you the vectors. Um, there's a reason I'm going to show you the vectors. I, I'm, I'm sure some of you have just died inside because you've seen these a thousand times. There is a reason I'm going to show you the vectors. I'm going to show you something slightly new about the way vector programs work. So has anyone not seen this before? A couple of hands have gone up. OK. I'll, um, so hopefully, hopefully what I'm about to show you will be enough. Um, ask me afterwards if you want a, a bit more detail. Um, basic idea is the lengths are encoded in the type. So if, if I'm writing an append function and I say that um, a vector has n things and another vector has m things, then the resulting vector has n plus m things. Now, a question sometimes people ask is, uh, if they haven't seen this before, is what are these n, a, and m? You know, where are they bound? So these are, these are implicitly bound in the type. These are implicit arguments. Um, so they are going to be arguments to the append function uh, just like any other argument. But there's something a bit special about them, because they're only there because we wanted them in the type. So let's just write this program, and I'll show you a bit more about what that means. So um, the type-driven development way is you give a type, you ask the machine things about your type, it will give you a bit more of your program. So I'll say type, define, refine. So come up with the type, come up with a definition, and then the refine the definition in the type as we learn more about the problem. So in this case, um, I'm going to... I'm going to try. That's, that menu is too small, isn't it? But uh, some, sometimes I get feedback that says, I can't see what you're doing when you use the keyboard. So please, could you uh, use the context menu? I don't think you can see what I'm doing when I use the context menu either. But at least you can see when I'm doing it. So this says uh, add definition. It's OK. So that's added a candidate definition for append. And this thing on the right, this is a whole. So this is what I really want people to be in. This is the way I want people to be interacting with the system is uh, adding a candidate definition, seeing the whole, working with the whole. So if I check the type of that whole, we'll see what we have in scope and what we, uh, what we need to produce. So oh, this is, yeah, that's, hopefully that's legible. So what do we have in scope? We have our m, a, and n. We have our vector x's, and we have our vector y's. But we have these mysterious zeros next to m, a, and n. So these zeros, these are the quantities. So these say, you can talk about m, a, and n as much as you like at compile time, but there will be zero of them at runtime. So guaranteed, these are erased. Guaranteed, the, the, the type system ensures that they won't appear in our program. OK, so next step. Um, is we'll uh, ask the machine to case split on one of these variables. That gives us uh, the two possible cases. And um, you might have seen this before, that, that, that if, you've got a, if you've got a bit more information in the type, that means the machine can help you out a bit more and you know, maybe search for a program based on what's in scope. So I'll do that again. If I hit Control-Alt-S for search, then, oop, then, then it doesn't work because I didn't save it, and I knew that would happen. So let's try that again. So um, control l s will just search for possible implementations of this program, and then control l s again in the other case. This is the first program it finds that matches that type. So, so far, so much what you've seen before with a dependently typed language. So I thought, well, oh, sometimes people ask, in fact, you've done, you've done a few things there kind of repeatedly, the same thing. There's almost a pattern to what you're doing. You, you, you're almost brute force case split, search, see what happens, case split a bit more, search, see what happens. And why don't you ask the machine to do those steps for you? There's a, there's a, there's a process we're following. And somehow the, the, the act of programming is not just about the end result. It's sort of what we do to get there. And, and we, we, we kind of know that when we write programs and we, do, we, we have programs that are re repetitive, so re um, we, have, we see repeated patterns in the code itself, 
we abstract it away. So wouldn't it be nice if we could abstract away the act of programming? So if we could just say, you know, keep case splitting and searching until you find an answer. And hilariously, that works quite well. So control alt g is just do that. So same for zip with, just, you know, got to save it. Same for zip with, just, just do that. And all it's doing, literally all it's doing, is like, you know when you see a card trick and it looks amazing, and then they tell you how it's done and you think, oh, I could do that. That's literally all that's happened. This is just a magic trick. But um, the cool thing is, just because we've given that little extra bit of information in the type, we can do that magic trick. And we can sort of, what I really want to be able to, so this is hard coded, this uh, in, into the system, the sort of split and search thing. Um, what I really want is for you to be able to write your own abstractions over the bits of program that you would have written and see what comes out. So just to, it's good to have a flavor, to sort, of, sort of a bit of a feel for the kinds of things that search can do. Um, sometimes uh, I see people comment that, oh no, you're taking my job away as a programmer. Well, no, you still have to know what you're doing. You still have to know the programs you want to write. And it's still good to have a feel for when it's going to work. So um, this is, I guess, kind of when you're doing um, kind of plumbing, you're taking bits out of pairs and putting them into new pairs. So, um, so these examples I've, I've got up here that at the top, these are sort of manipulating pairs. So they're examples taken out of the GIN documentation. So you know the GIN tool for Haskell? So this is a tool that uses uh, Roy Dickov's uh, uh, proof search algorithm to uh, extract programs from types. And uh, pleasingly, uh, this sort of thing, uh, oops, if I hit, there we go. If I hit the right key, it helps. This is a new laptop. I still haven't got used to where all the keys are. <laughs> so this is because uh, I've, I've, I've moved from Mac to Linux because uh, uh, I heard that next year is the year of Linux on the desktop. So, um, so I'm, I'm not entirely used to where all the keys are. Anyway, so these ones all, um, all work uh, quite nicely. So kind of pulling things out of pairs. Uh, another sort of place which comes up in practice is if you have one data structure related to another data structure, you might have some invariance that you express in the type. So here I've got, um, this is a heterogeneous list. I'm not going to go through the, exactly the details of how this works, except to say that uh, every element has a type, and we encode the types of the elements in uh, the type of the heterogeneous list. Um, so I sort of feel that if we go to the trouble of expressing a predicate that says that a value at a particular location is a particular type, surely we've done enough work to write the program that pulls that value out of the list. I shouldn't have to write that program again. So I go to the machine and I say, I've done it once. Uh, you finish it. So off you go. So that's a kind of feel for the kinds of places where it works. So right, if you're thinking, oh, yeah, you just carefully picked them because you knew that they would work, well, guilty. Um, this one, I actually came up with this one in a pub yesterday watching the cricket. And I was a little bit distracted. And I got it wrong about three times. But every time it said no. And it was only when I got the type right that it said, yes, here's the program. So that's kind of fun. Um, Again, I, this is, you know, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I find it weirdly pleasing just to generate programs as when I'm procrastinating. It's just, you know. um, okay, so that's the, the, the type-driven uh, editing is something I want to make a big thing, and I want it to be programmable. Here it's hard-coded. It's hard-coded in terms of some primitives that have been glued together, but it um, turns out you can do quite a lot with it already. Now, here's the really interesting thing, I think, about... The, the, the new thing about the language, and this is where I've drawn very heavily on Colin McBride and Bob Atkey's work, and I'm so glad they did this because I've wanted this for ages, but I don't have the skills to figure out the, uh, the type theory details myself. So, so, um, uh, so Bob and Connor did this, uh, these lovely papers on it. Uh, I've tried to implement it to see what we can do in practice. So uh, also, if, if, you've, if you've seen any of the uh, linear Haskell work, I don't know if anyone's looked at that. It's, it's a similar kind of idea, so a similar kind of intuition that... Um, so the, the, the intuition that I'm highlighting that doesn't really help, but um, if, if you have a function, uh, a function of x and you say in the type that there is one of x, then the intuition is going to be that if f of x is used once, exactly once, then you know x is used exactly once. But essentially, it means it's a thing you can use once. So let's say we're trying to build a pair of things. So we're trying to build a pair of things from from a thing. So for, for x and a, we can always build a pair of a's because, you know, parametricity, there's, there's only one thing it could possibly be. So um, let's, let's search and we get that. 
but I'm using X twice. So if I were to say something like, OK, I'm only going to use X once, then, well, let's try writing that. Uh, if I try to generate it, you get, um, I haven't figured out in Atom how to make this font size adjustable. But it basically says it went wrong. So it said it can't find a definition for, for this function. Um, let's, let's dig a bit deeper as to why that is. So we'll try adding a definition. And I'll look at the type of pair RHS. Um, I used to call this uh, DUP, but I don't like having DUP around, so I, I call it pair now. Um, so uh, I only have one X, um, and I need to produce two A's. So sure, I could use one X. Uh, so let's use one X. And if I check the type of this pair RHS now, then I see that I have no X's. So I, I can't use X anymore. I've spent it. I can talk about it. It's available. I can reason about it as much as I like, but I can't have it in the program. And if I, I guess it's probably better to show this somewhere where the font is big enough. Um, what do I call it? QTT.IDR. Um, it says, uh, there are two uses of linear name X. Just occurred to me this morning when I was working through this. I, I put this jaunty little message, enjoy yourself. And it's just told you that your program's wrong. And I'm, I'm thinking that might. <laughs> That might start to annoy me. So I might put sorry or something, you know, anything I can do to help. I don't know, whatever. Um, right, so um, oh, sometimes, again, people sometimes ask, what happens if I put x second? Just, so just to show you, just to save you asking. Um, if you put x second, you can still use x, and you can't use x here. So, so there's, no, there's no left to right ordering or anything here. It's really about it being used in the whole program. So we can't, we can't finish that. Another thing we can't do, like we, we might want to express that something is only something we want to talk about, but something we don't want to use. So a typical place where, that, where you might want to do that is, is if you have proofs. Um, so you don't want your proofs hanging around at runtime, but you do want them at compile time because they're telling you interesting things about your program. This is a, a very trivial example. Uh, it's not actually a proof. But let's say I'm, I'm, I'm trying to invert this B. Well, I'm not going to be able to do that because I've said I can't um, pattern match on it. So it does actually let me do the case split, which it shouldn't. But if I, if I try loading it again, um, it says attempt to match on erased arguments. So I can't, I can't inspect anything that is a, a zero quantity. So I'll get rid of that because it's in the way. Um, and finally, something that I sort of discovered by accident. So uh, when, you, when you see people talk about linear types, often the things they cite as the value of linear types is either resource tracking, so we can show that a protocol is being followed and you're not referring to old, uh, old things, you're not aliasing when you shouldn't, that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, for performance reasons, you might want to use uh, the linearity to say, well, I don't need to allocate memory here. I can just reuse the thing I spent. Both of these things are really cool. But kind of by accident, I discovered that the linearity gives more information to the type, pro uh, type directed synthesis. So here, I, I've got a, a map function where I'm consuming the list exactly once. So that turns out um, to be enough to find the definition, because there's, there's only one way of consuming that list exactly once um, in order to build this progress. Oh, that was a, a cool little uh, side effect of this thing. Uh, yes, question, yes. Uh, that's a fantastic question. I'll show you after. It doesn't work. Uh, the, it's a fantastic question, but I'd better move on. So, uh, but I'd love to talk to you about this, because I know you have interesting things to say about this. <laughs> so, um, right. Let me show you an example of that in practice. Again, this is an example you may have seen before. I'm going to use it again, because the quantities turn out to give us new things to say about uh, writing transpose on vectors, So, on matrices, rather. So if I've got an n by n matrix, and I, I want to give back an n by n matrix, and we're just going to work through the t with the types and see what the type-driven approach uh, can do. So uh, usual thing, I'll add uh, a candidate definition. Um, there's not a lot I can do. There's kind of a forced choice that I, unless I happen to know how to write this program already, um, like it's, it's basically it's a zip with of cons. But let's assume we don't know how to write this program already. We'll work through it and see what see what to do next. The only thing we can really do is um, is a pattern match on the matrix. So oops, we'll do that. Um, what I like to do if I've got something that's starting to look a little bit complicated is just rename the whole. 
and then I hit um, Control Alt L, and it gives me the type of the thing that will implement this program um, where, when I get around to it. And we're going to see fairly quickly that we have a problem. So I'm going to try writing empties. So empties is going to produce us m copies of an empty vector. But if I look at the type, see that I'm not allowed to have m at runtime. So it is, it is zero quantity at runtime. So there's no way I'm going to be able to produce m copies of the empty vector because m is not available to me at runtime. So the thing we have to do is, so this is, this is where Idris 1 and Idris 2 have a slightly annoying incompatibility, is if I want this to be available at runtime, I have to write it explicitly as part of the type. Um, so um, the, the rule of, well, the rule of thumb, Basically, if you write it down, it's in your program. If you don't write it down, it's not. If you want to be completely explicit about it, you can give the quantity uh, explicitly. So now if I, if I lift out empties, it says, OK, M is available. So I, can, I now can generate things from M at runtime. And pleasingly, they generate it for me. So more interesting case is um, transposing the rest of the vector. So um, the way I like to think about this is we can transpose x's recursively, and then somehow we have to rotate the other vector, kind of rotate it onto the top. So we're going to cons the, the corresponding elements of, of our first vector onto the transposed uh, second vector. So a good place to start is by making a recursive call, so <laughs> invoking the inductive hypothesis. Um, so. And I'll do the same thing as before. I'll, uh, I'll call this. It's, it's a bit complicated, so I'll ask the machine to generate me the type for this thing and um, lift it out. And I might have, let's just do this and see what happens. Um, uh, does anyone think that's the right answer? I'll tell you now, it's not the right answer. Uh, this doesn't actually terminate. Um, I haven't put a termination checker in the type directed program search yet. So. I like to show this just because like, you can't just blindly press buttons and hope that the program comes out is going to be the right program. We have to think a little bit about what we're doing. And what's happened here is we've kind of given transpose helper too much information. We, we, in order for the machine to help us, we have to tell the machine a little bit more about what we mean. So um, I'm going to undo this. I'm going to show you the type of transpose helper in this context. So, so it says, uh, says what we've got. What have we got? We've got we've got our x's, we've got our transposed x's, we've got our x that we want to glue on the front. Now, because I've done this before, I happen to know that there is a piece of information that we have, we know, that we haven't told the machine. So the question is, if you're transposing a vector or transposing a matrix, how many times are we going to use that matrix? Exactly once. So maybe if we tell it, that we're going to use the matrix exactly once. Maybe then it'll help us a bit more. So you know, it can it can only help us if we uh, if we give it a bit more information. So let's. Uh, oops. They've put um, the page up key where I expect there to be a left arrow, which is kind of um, kind of awkward. Okay, so if we lift it out now, this is not quite visible. No, oh, let's just let's just generate it. Um, so. Pressing the wrong button again. Finally, so uh, if we give it that extra little bit of information, that let's make that visible on the screen, that the vector is only going to be used once, then it's not going to pass that vector that we've already spent to the transpose helper function, so it can help us out um, a little bit more. Um, so, by the way, uh, there's a step that we haven't done here, and probably a lot of you are screaming inside, it's just zip with, come on, it's just zip with. Yes, it is just zip with. It's a kind of instance of zip with. Something sort of in, in my dreams, in, in the dream version of this system, you'll sort of get to the end of this, and the machine will say, you know, Clippy will pop up and say, it looks like you're implementing zip with again. <laughs> would you like me to refactor that for you? And I, I think that would be a very nice thing to have. And I think, you know, a, a feasible thing to, um, to believe that we could do one day. Uh, but it, today is not that day. Uh, okay, I haven't shown you any programs running yet. Let's, let's at least run this one. Um, it's, I mean, it's, uh, I've, I've got a main program that generates a, um, 
uh, a, um, uh, a vector, and if I do colon exec, I give it uh, just to just to show that it type checks, so we can ship it. Uh, it's uh, we've got a couple of vectors, and then we've got a transpose version of those vectors. And it's, I guess it's worth throwing in at this point that um, uh, we can generate. Um, an executable, I suppose. Um, as things stand, the executable it generates is in scheme. So there we are. Um, so this is um, running via Shea scheme. Uh, uh, so uh, Shea scheme is something that's been developed over, especially over decades at, at, at Cisco, recently open sourced. And I thought, okay, that would be a good stop stopgap. Um, it turns out that uh, Shea scheme is astonishingly fast. So even from source, the Shea scheme generated version for the small set of benchmarks I've tried has run faster than the Idris one, which goes via C. Um, so I guess spending 30 years of knowing what you're doing uh, is quite good if you're writing a runtime system. So, so it'd, it'd be interesting to see what could happen if someone who knows how to write a runtime system could get their hands on, 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 on the Idris compiler. I'd love for that to happen. Um, OK, so the other interesting thing, so I have about so, so 10 or 15 minutes left. And the thing I really wanted to get to was resource tracking. I think that's the, uh, one of the cool things you can do with um, quantitative type theory. And it's something where it really pays to have interactive editing. So if you're trying to write uh, a program which does complicated things in the type system, and you have to get the whole program right, before the compiler will accept it, that can get quite frustrating. But if you can do it step by step and have the machine tell you what you need to do next, I think that can be a lot more helpful. So without going into all of the details about how this works, I'm just going to give, like, kind of, um, just going to give an overview of what's happened. Of what happens? Uh, there's a, um, I guess you'd call it a, a, a linear, linear I/O monad or something like that. Uh, it's not really a monad, but uh, a, a linear embedded DSL that allows us to describe uh, when we create and destroy resources. So my favorite way of illustrating this is with a protocol for describing the movements of a door, whether a door is open or not. There are two things we can do in this protocol. We can open the door, we can close the door, but if we open the door, the door might not open. So we're not always in complete control of what happens in the outside world. Um, so it might be that we say open the door, but the machine tells us whether opening the door actually succeeded. So let's see how this works. Um, so just to read these types, so one is a program in this linearity monad that produces a thing that's just used once. Uh, any is a program that produces a thing that can be used any number of times. And there's a little bit of type level jiggery pokery to feed this together. Again, that's a talk for another day how this works. But let's just, let's just see what happens. Um, so if I start writing a program in this uh, linearity, well, let's, let's create a new door. So D is a new door. Uh, and we'll check what we have. So at every stage, we'll check what we have and what we need. So what we have, so we have, a, we have an M that's just in, in type world. We have a door that's currently closed, and we have exactly one of it. So what could we do with a door that's closed? We could, we could knock on it. Um, so D prime is knock D. I'm going to call it D prime because we, then we can see everything that we have. So, so D is still a closed door, but it's a closed door that we had in the past. D prime is the closed door that we have now. Um, so we can't work with D anymore. We can still talk about it. We can still talk about the glorious history of how the door was before we knocked on it, but we can't have that door as before we knocked on it. More interestingly, we could try opening a door. So the, the type of open door is this thing. I'm not going to tell you what this thing is, because I'm going to show you interactively what this is. We're going to learn interactively by talking to the machine what this is. So result is uh, open door on D prime. Um, and let's have, a, let's have a look at that. Uh, it's, it's, it's some res thing. So res, uh, it's, it's kind of a dependent pair. It's the, the first thing is a result, and the second thing is a resource with a type computed from that result. So this is going to be, given the result, it's going to be a door that's either open or closed, depending on what this Boolean actually is at runtime. So what we're going to do is talk about what this is at compile time, but at, at runtime, we'll actually find out what it is. So the easiest way to find out what, you know, what this is made of is to kind of do a 
No, I don't know. I didn't spell that right, but I'm going to pattern match on it anyway. So if I pattern match on the result of this, uh, we've got an x at y. What are x at y? Again, we, ju we just look at the holes to find out what we've got. Um, and it says we've, we've got a few things we've spent, but the things that we've got are the x, which is the result of the operation. Let's make that all visible. And the y, which is a door that, depending on x, it's going to be either open or closed. So um, let's case split on x. If I case split on x, then that's either true or false. So, oops. Um, so this is the this is the case where this is door prog RHS two. So in this case, x was true, so the door is open. So now we can we can carry on working with the door and carrying on with the protocol. And in the second case, the door was uh, door opening did not succeed. So if I check the type of RHS3, it says, in this case, y is a closed door. So, and the only way I'm going to be able to complete writing this program is if I, you know, finish up and delete the door. So, um, while, while something, if I have something with a quantity 1 in the type, I have to spend it before, um, uh, before, um, before I'm allowed to continue. Uh, so, so, I have to make sure that, uh, that this y has been consumed, and I can consume it by uh, deleting the door. So hopefully that'll type check. It did. Good. So that's the basic idea of encoding protocols using linearity. And it looks like I have about five minutes, which means I can show you the um, concurrent programming example. So kind of a, a basic version of session types encoded using this, this kind of language. So what have we got? Um, I'll, I'll just show the, the way I encode the protocols. And again, I'm not going to show you all the details. Just let this be a flavor of what you can do. Um, so a protocol, I describe a protocol with a, sort of a global session type, so a global description of the protocol. So this says, in the protocol, there will be a request to a server that is of type bool. And then the rest of the protocol says, well, if that boolean is true, then the server will send me back a character. If that boolean is false, then the server will send me back a string. So what's quite fun about this is because we have the full extent of the language, we don't need to do any, anything beyond essentially sequencing, or sequencing and dependency. So any kind of choice, we can, enco we can encode using the, the, the address language operators. Um, so I have a client for this protocol. So I've completed the client here, but I'm, I, what I'm going to do is I'll just um, I'll, I'll comment it out. I'll comment out most of it. Um, and we'll, uh, so all I'm doing is, you know, sending a couple of messages. I did the sleep just to convince myself that it was working. So you don't actually need that sleep. Um, so uh, where is it? It's in, um, there we go. So, um, so let's check the, uh, I don't need to do that here, do I? I can do it, I can do it in the, in the editor. Um, right, so um, it says I have a channel and the channel has a type. And the interesting thing to look at, the most important thing to look at, is what is the first thing we do on the channel. So the first thing we're going to do on this channel is send a Boolean. So we do that. Check the type of our hole again. It says, right, the next thing you have to do on this channel is send a string. And the reason we have to send a string is because the Boolean was false. And that's what, the, that's what the protocol says. Oh, sorry, the reason we have to receive a string, the way I expect to receive a string, is because that was false. If that was a true, then, as one would hope, the next thing we're going to receive is a character. The type said so. So we're using, the, uh, so we're using this interactive editing to say, not to write the whole program at once, but to say, step by step, uh, what, it, what is it that we have to do next? And by the way, this is where I think this um, programmable um, program search could be really valuable because it might be that you're working in a world where you've got multiple protocols going on at once or you've got multiple resources that you need to deal with and there are several valid things that you could do next. I mean here the, the valid thing to do next in this protocol is going to be to receive something but it might be that the next thing I want to do is nothing to do with the protocol. So it might be that you want to write kind of special purpose tactics for okay I want to do the protocol thing now do me the next thing in the protocol. That's not ready yet. That's not something we have a language for expressing yet. I would love to have a language for expressing that. Um, so let's uh, you know, complete that. 
So that's, uh, that's, that's, so that's our complete client. Um, it's worth seeing what happens if this goes wrong. I haven't really shown you any error messages, or many error messages yet. Let's see what happens if I try to, um, if I send true and then I just pull back the, uh, the, um, the string. So this has to be a string because I'm using string append. So this hopefully won't type check. Because if, if this type checks, then everything about this is a lie. Uh, oh, thank God for that. Uh, so, so it didn't type. It mismatch between character and a string. That's what we expect. So it's expecting a character. It got a string. Um, so uh, it's, uh, if we look at the, so the, the error messages are a little bit ugly. I think I think this is something where if someone came in to, to polish this up a bit, I think it could be really valuable. Because uh, you know, if you look at if you look if you get the location and you match the location to the point in the file, you'll find it's exactly this that it's pointing at. So it's exactly this that's got. I mean, it's kind of technically it's this that we did wrong, but uh, this is the point where it found the error. So I think I think that's somewhere where it might be worth exploring where we can do a bit better here too. So something else that might go wrong is, you know, let's imagine that we've sold, this is our million dollar business, this little protocol, and then, then a customer comes along and says, oh, actually, I want you to send an integer back uh, after the character. So, uh, hang on, I'm, oh, I'm in string, aren't I? False, yeah, okay. I want you to send an integer back after the string. So it's always interesting to see what happens if I, if I don't so much violate the protocol, but I change the protocol so that my program doesn't work anymore. So what happens? It says, oh, no, you've got a mismatch here because uh, you need to send some, oh, this is, this is actually in the server. So you need to send something, but what you did was close the channel. So, so by so by changing that um, uh, expression of the uh, that, that description of the protocol, we've got a type error in the program. So essentially, that's session types. Um, this is kind of kind of basic implementation of second types. But one thing I think one one thing I found really nice is that it turns out if you have dependent linear types, then it's a natural thing to be able to express. So, uh, so that's my last example. Um, I'm going to show you my conclusion slide, if you can call it a slide. Um, so I think Idris 2 is making some good progress. I'm certainly having uh, loads of fun with it. I'm just having loads of fun not waiting for the result of the type checker, quite honestly. Um, so most of the Idris 1 constructs are there. Sadly, there's a couple of incompatibilities. So we're not just going to be able to suddenly flick a switch and be self-hosting. There's, there's a little bit more of a step to do. Uh, I think it's a, a step that's worth taking, because uh, you know, working with your own system, you're, you're always going to make it better. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty much there. It's there. I, I would love for people to have a go. Let me know uh, what you succeed with, what you don't succeed with, anything we can do to help. Um, quantitative type theory, I've only just started playing with it. You've basically seen every bit of QTT I've done in some form uh, uh, in this talk. Um, so I think we're going to have a lot of fun exploring what is actually possible what kinds of things we can express. It's going to be fun finding that out. And then interactive editing. Uh, there's a lot more we can do with interactive editing. Um, it's really important that it's responsive. So this, this, I, I want this to be the default mode in which you, uh, people interact with the system. If that's going to be the case, it has to come back with the answer very quickly. So I think we need to put a lot of that effort into, uh, into efficiency that we just haven't so far. Finally, definitely need your help. Um, just there are some little things, some big things. Like we could always use more libraries. We could use, you know, work on package management tools. We could use more editor support. Um, for example, I prefer to be using Vim than Atom. Um, sorry, I said that out loud to the Emacs users, but there you have it. Um, bit of polish would be nice. You know, pretty error messages. Bit of tab completion. All all sorts of things. So if you look at if you go to the GitHub repo. Um, I've, written a, uh, I've written a lot of this down in, in contributing.md. If there's anything I can do that could help you find your way around uh, the code base, please let me know. Uh, I'm nearly out of time, so I probably don't have many time for questions, but uh, much time for questions, but thank you for your attention. There's one over here. <laughs> Hello. Thank Hi. you. Entertaining as always. Um, just in your door example, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. The dependent pair, you had x at y. Yeah. And y was linear, but x was not. I couldn't yes. quite work out why that is. That, uh, that's because I didn't show you the definition of that type. 
and it's because I say in the type, first thing is not linear, but the second thing is. So, um, so, so you can do that. So, kind of disappointingly, so, I, you, I kind of wanted to give a more magical answer, but yeah, that's, that's what it is. Um, Okay, thank you.